Hello, and welcome to The Brian Diaries, where our pals and I get together and talk about subjects dealing with our favorite tabletop role-playing setting, The World of Darkness. While we may not be subject matter experts on the game lines, we have a passion that has led us to create and share actual plays with you all. Eventually we thought, well shit, we might as well take a stab at a podcast, and here you go. Each episode, we will have a guest content creator to join us to talk about whatever subject is on the table. If you'd like to contact us, you can reach out to us on Twitter at twin underscore cities underscore VTM or on Facebook at Twin Cities by Night. So here we go. I hope you enjoy. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Brian Diaries. We got a new name for our gang I was going to throw out here in some creative way, but we like to call ourselves the Bold Crew. That's something that Tillman came up with. We're kind of disciples of the cold that's, brew. That's just you, Chris. That's just me. Like, I love, like, you. saying that. I feel like I got, like, a gang behind me. Like, I'm Michael Jackson and beat it, and there's a bunch of people dancing behind oh, me. Oh, my God. Dude, it's insane, man. So, did I fucking tell you, man, that my wife introduced me to something new recently, man? Talking about cold brew. Do you know that they sell cold brew concentrate now to where you can, like, oh, make your God. own cold brew drinks? It's it's an it's insane, man. So you're my wife showed me. She gave, she gave me this little class. She looked up on how. Hey, to make this it. is supposed to be an introduction, and you're going on a tangent. God damn it! Let me talk about my cold brew. Fuck, that's how this show is unofficially sponsored by Starbucks cold brew. But yeah, so you're supposed to make it one third, uh, one part cold brew, two parts milk or almond milk, like I use. And I've kind of flipped it now to where it's like two parts cold brew, one part milk. And man, am I fucking fired up! Before we start, though, I want to give a shout out to uh, someone from across the Atlantic, man, someone across the pond who hit us up recently, another podcast called Dungeon Punks. You know, when, when, you, when you're a content creator and you're doing actual plays and podcasts and everything like that, when you are told by someone that they enjoy your stuff, man, it really is like a dopamine hit. It really makes you feel awesome. And, and I really appreciate the people who have said that. But when you have another like content creator in the scene who like will give you a shout out on their show and, and, and out of the blue and they and they hit you up and they tell you like, hey, listen, you know, on my new podcast we talked about you, it is just fucking amazing. And I really have to get a shout out to the Dungeon Punks for uh, that's P U N X, by the way, if you guys are looking them up. They're pal they're friends with my pal uh, Brendan Carrion from Full Metal RPG. The one the host hit me up and he's like, hey man, we talked about your actual play and they had nothing but the nicest things to say. And I want to, I really want to say from the bottom of my heart, thank you, man. I was telling the guys in our gang, uh, the bold crew, <laughs> I was telling them that, uh, how good it felt to hear that, especially just like on a Friday afternoon, like coming home from work and, and, and having someone hit you up just on the random like that. So thank you, brother. It means a lot. I'm glad you're enjoying our stuff. And, uh, it's really, uh, it's really an honor to call you friend now. So I appreciate it. But today we're actually joined by someone else from across the pond. Uh, you know, Andrew, you know, one sign that you're really badass is when you go by two different names, man, you know, right? Like, I wish I had a second name. I don't have a second name. I just, you know, go by Chris Zach. But the, the guest that we have on today, I don't even feel I have to introduce this gentleman, but I'm going to anyways, uh, is Matthew Dawkins, a.k.a. the Gentleman Gamer. The, the uh, Man, this guy, when I was introduced to him, it kind of blew my mind because I – a couple years ago, for those of you who already know my story, I got back into White Wolf Games, got back into Vampire the Masquerade, and I, at the time, I was going through this like whole Song of Ice and Fire trip where I was trying to read the books and like decode them, like the the um, Da Vinci Code, you know, find these secret plots and all this stuff. And there's tons of YouTube videos where people have these different theories about the series. And so when I got back into the Vampire the Masquerade, World of Darkness stuff, one of the first questions I asked because you know, it's a lot easier when t someone tells you stuff so you don't have to read it, is um, is there any YouTube series where someone covers the history of World of Darkness, covers all this stuff that I can just kind of like uh, mindlessly watch at work? And the Gentleman Gamer was recommended to me. And I went and watched, and holy cow, was just completely fucking blown away by the amount of material that this guy had, man. It was just so crazy. I, I just found myself watching, watching, watching. Then I watched the Ivory Tower actual play well, when we first started our actual plays, and just really blew my mind. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Matthew Dawkins, a.k.a. The Gentleman Gamer. What is up, sir? How is it going? Hello there. Uh, yeah, things are things are good. Things are very interesting today, Chris. Uh, there's been a lot of a lot of interesting news in the role playing world on a lot of projects that I'm working on, and uh, on the subject of a song of ice and fire, Stannis is obviously the the the, the rightful king of Westeros, but I don't rate his chances highly. Uh, <laughs> based, on, based 
<laughs> the media portrayals of, of the character. Uh, yeah, even probably if not. Some of us, even if some of us don't feel they're in keeping with how he is presented in the novels, but still, well, that's not why I'm here. We, we can talk about George R. R. Martin's books at some other point, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, you're here to give us a little bit of a sense of like the surreal mood of interviewing someone who uh, just got us involved in the scene. So thank mm. you for being here. Oh well, no, I'm I'm glad to have done so. It's it's always nice to be a guest instead of a host. And uh, yeah, I've been very busy recently. Uh, as it's, I guess, my time to plug something. So let's see, what should I plug? I'm working on a lot of books right now, writing a lot of books, developing a lot of books. I am for Onyx Path Publishing, developing the Contagion Chronicle, which is the big crossover book for basically all of the lead splats, the lead game lines for Chronicles of Darkness, Requiem, Forsaken, uh, Awakening, and so on. This is the big core book that allows them all to play together in factions that support them and give them a reason for working together. Uh, it's not going to be a book of what do I, what happens if I use Mage Sight on a vampire and encyclopedic questions like that, which I know is what some people want, but that isn't what I want, and I'm the developer. It's a book of of settings, of plot hooks, of chronicle seeds, and uh, and conditions and tilts and all kinds of things that um, can be utilized for for chronicles that actually involve a mage and a mummy and a Promethean and a Sin Eater in the same in the same group or same faction as they're called in Contagion. So what else am I doing? I'm also developing a book for Werewolf of Forsaken shunned by the moon and shunned by the moon is a night horrors book uh, a book of antagonists and the thing i really like about the night horrors books is i love bestiaries for pathfinder D, pretty much everything and wealth of forsaken is a game with so many rich antagonists with your hosts your pure your bale hounds ghost wolves and so on and this book i am intending on making it the monster manual for chronicles of darkness while you have primarily wealth of forsaken antagonists in it there is every reason to use them in any Chronicles of Darkness game if you pick this book up. I want it to be the book that people pick up and it really makes them fall in love with Werewolf of Forsaken again. Uh, what else do we have? We also have They Came From Beneath the Sea. They Came From Beneath the Sea is the game that I conceptualized. I sold the rights to it to Onyx Path Publishing and I'm now developing it via Onyx Path Publishing. And it's a game of B-movie sci-fi horror horror hijinks and farce uh, some of the fun mechanics in that game involve quips and cinematics quips being uh canny one-liners that you can pull out you'll have a deck of cards you can um pull your quips out and if you use them at appropriate times your characters get modifiers that sort of thing very simple cinematics are things where you can insert a deleted scene so if you forgot to do something in the previous scene you can play the deleted scene card basically and go back in time and play that out again you can in or alternatively the opposite is let's say you're about to be eaten by centipus the hundred tentacled octopus and there's no way for your characters to get out if you have got the scene missing card you can basically cut and your characters reappear somewhere completely different you can never ever talk about what happened in that interim in character or out of character you have just somehow got to where you are now you can allude to what happened like i never i've never seen someone do that with a melon before but you can't actually explain how you got there because the scene is missing so it's a game that plays with the idea of 1950s b movies mystery science theater that kind of thing and that's been a lot of fun to work on as a writer, I'm on Mage of the Awakenings, Night Horrors book. I am on, I'm, I'm also developing the Book of Oblivion for Wraith the Oblivion, uh, which is the big book of antagonists, necropoli, tempests, uh, natural disasters in the underworld. That's a lot of fun. And, and, well, I guess to wrap up Onyx Path for a little bit, uh, we are, of course, kickstarting Geist, the Sin Eaters second edition right now. Uh, I'll confess, it's a book I have had no direct involvement in, and that makes me more excited for it because it means I haven't actually seen it uh, from the ground up. But I did do the voiceover video for the Kickstarter, so there you go. I, I, I have touched it at least tangentially. And Geist is one of those fantastic games that didn't get enough coverage when it had a first edition because it was at the tail end of the original White Wolf's uh, publishing run. 
But second edition has done staggeringly well in the first few days of the Kickstarter, uh, and it can only do better. So I'm really looking forward to to seeing how that goes. Um, oh, um, I, I'm going to self promote for a little bit longer and just say that for Green Ronin Publishing, I have worked on the modern age role playing game, both the core, the companion, and another unannounced book that's coming up. And Green Ronin are another fantastic company. It's always a joy to work for them. For White Wolf Entertainment, I am I have worked on Vampire Fifth Edition, Vampire the Masquerade Fifth Edition, which is of course a huge project that will be released at Gen Con. And I uh, I pretty much wrote the majority of the Camarilla book and some of the Anarch book as well. Uh, for Chaosium, I've got various work in the pipeline. I guess in short. I've been very busy over the last few months, I guess, to a year. It's um, It's been a lot of fun working in this industry. But yeah. Oh my goodness, it sounds like it. Shit, yeah. Do you drink cold brew too? I bet you drink cold brew. Tell us you drink cold brew, man. You know, <laughs> my day. I, assume, I assume cold brew is a, if it's a Starbucks thing, it has coffee in it, yeah? Yeah, I, I guess over the pond they would call it maybe cold tea, but cold brew. What cold brew is is like a stronger version of coffee where they like distill it and they serve it, they serve it cold and it's One like nitro things. Uh yeah, but yeah, uh, yeah. I guess yeah, it's kind of similar to nitro. But star everyone makes it now, but Starbucks, <clears throat> Starbucks sponsor us is the is the best. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm I, I have never drank more than half a cup of coffee. I had it probably when I was in my early teens, and since then I just thought, no, nah, no. Nah. I like. I live off this stuff. Coffee. I know a lot of people do. A lot of people will swear by coffee. They'll say, I can't function in the morning until I've had my first <laughs> cup of coffee. And you get the same thing, you know, I can't function unless I've had my first cigarette. And uh, for me, it's, um, I guess my, my, my crutch is breakfast. You know, mm. I've got to have breakfast in the morning. But coffee, never done anything for me. And same with energy drinks in general. I just, they just don't work for me. And somehow I still do all this writing. I don't know what it is. <laughs> Maybe it just means I'll die by at the time of 35. <laughs> hey, hey, I just way down I, I want to take a step back for a moment. Just real quick. Uh, the title of that game, the card game you were talking about with the scenes and the B-movies mm. and all that. What was that again? Oh, well, so it was a role-playing game. Um, but there will be cards with it. Oh, okay. you, can, um, you can roll from a random table as well, but uh, having play tested it, it's a lot more fun with cards. It's a visual aid. People interact with them more. Uh, it's They Came From Beneath the Sea, uh, The with an exclamation mark at the end, I should point out. Um, there's a lot of exclamation marks in that game, but not an offensive amount. This is a game that is now in editing, uh, I just I concluded development on it last week. We've I've gone through a lot of playtesting with it, a lot of UK conventions, and the Wrecking Crew are running it at Gen Con this year. I imagine oh, I'll be cool. running demos too. But yeah, looking forward to that release because it's kind of my baby in the RPG world. It um, it sounds amazing, and I I definitely need to get my hands on that. So. Thank you. Oh, I'm glad you think so. It sounds oh. like a fun drinking game. Like you know what I mean? A game that I don't want to like yeah. like drink while I'm playing. Well, you joke, but we did do that. One of the play- <laughs> one of the play- <laughs> um, we did a version where whenever you if you can ever sort of pull a quip off successfully, you have to down your shot. Um, and for a while at the beginning, everyone was very tentative because in a lot of drinking games, you drink because you fail. Wait, uh, wait, wait! That's not no in the official would- rules. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't add a sidebar. No, I don't want it to come back from editing. I'll tell Dixie. Dixie's editing that one personally. So um, yeah, may- maybe we'll put some drinking game rules in there. Yeah, and that contagion, um, that contagion idea for that core book really, really, really ha- has sparked my interest reading about it in your guys' Monday morning notes and just seeing like information about it come out. I mean, I'm going to be throwing money at that like I did with Geist. I threw money at Geist right when that released too. One of those strengths of the the Chronicles of Darkness games in the crossover. A lot of times, people want to do these like grand crossover games with uh, the classic games, and and it's one of the things that uh, Chronicles does a lot better. And and having that type of book like on the horizon is really exciting. Yeah, I I mean recently, like you know, when I was first into White Wolf stuff, Chronicles wasn't a thing yet, and so re- coming into it. 
uh, when when we ran our uh, Chronicles of Darkness first edition game that we have on our channel, Ultimate Evil, I was really like, it's just that blue, that book blew me. The original first Ed Blue book, when I read that, I was just like, this is, I've been wanting this in the game without even realizing it, you know? Just like being a huge horror fan and having like, I just, I love Chronicles of Darkness. And now we're playing Changing the Lost, which is like, perhaps I find the most horrific, scary World of Darkness game that I've read or, or played, and I'm sure there's probably something scary out there, but I have a, 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 a newfound appreciation and respect for Chronicles of Darkness. I absolutely love it. So then hearing about this book, now it's giving me reason to read all these other splats for the Chronicles of Darkness too. So it's like, I got to read it. I got to spend money so I can, you know, appreciate this new book coming out. I Man. Remember the first time I ever played Changing Lost uh, was in Seattle. And... Um... I had just hiked, hitchhiked across North America. And uh, anyone who's listening to this podcast who's talked to me at length before will probably know this story, but they may not have heard this bit. So yeah, I hitchhiked from New York to Seattle over a month. It was a bit of a pilgrimage that I had to do. And uh, for stupid reasons that I would never repeat. And uh, <laughs> so I got to Seattle. I was staying with some friends there, thoroughly exhausted. And about two days in, after this lengthy trek, I was invited to play this game of Changing the Lost. And I was still incredibly shell-shocked after my sojourn. And so I wasn't really with it. I I wasn't with it for several days of just sitting still. And um, the, the group, within about an hour of play, were all in tears. And I had never seen anything like it before. This was really my first exposure to Changing the Lost. I was thinking, what the hell's going on? Because I was so out of it anyway. And I just kind of snapped to realization that these six Seattleites around me were just all in floods of tears from their game of Changing the Lost. And I thought, is this something people in Seattle just do? You know, is it, is it a very soft city? I don't know. Um, but no, well, yes. But uh, Changing the Lost, um, I, then I looked into it. I thought, wow, this game really handles trauma very well and does it in a way that I've never seen another role-playing game do. Um, so I was, of course, very pleased to see how well 2nd Edition did on Kickstarter, which, of course, you can still pay for on Backer Kit if you want to get a premium version. If you miss the Kickstarter, you just need to type in Changing the Lost Backer Kit into Google and you'll find that. But um, yeah, which it's... we highly recommend everyone check out. It is an amazing game. Oh, thank you. But yeah, we do, of course, have changed things. We have Sin Eaters from Geist Sin Eaters and all the rest of the lovely, lovely creatures, including Deviants in Contagion Chronicle. Um, <laughs> so if there's a, if there is a, if you ever wanted to play a game where you've had a werewolf, a beast, a Promethean in the same group. This game, the Contagion Chronicle, gives you the justification for doing it so that it isn't too ham fisted, and it gives you mechanical benefits for doing so as well. Part of the system in Contagion Chronicle is that the groups work better together, the factions, as they're called, and I will happily admit that I use the word factions because I love Planescape. Um, the factions work together when they are comprised of multiple different creatures. Because to, to go into the system a little, your characters can wield these powers called vectors, um, because hence contagion. And um, vectors are a way of channeling your faction's particular power ethos, if you like. So the cryptocracy are all about authority. The cryptocracy is one of the factions. Now, to use an example that may or may not be in the book, if you wanted to look at a power like Dominate from Vampire, um, we all know how Dominate works when vampires use it. But what would happen if a werewolf used it? How would that power manifest differently? Well, the vectors basically present the generic power, and then underneath it, each, well, different groups of uh, game lines. So let's say a demon, a mage, and a Promethean will can use the generic power but when they use it they get this edge to it when vampires werewolves and beasts use it they get this edge to it and then further down there's even more refinement for special specialization so if you have a member of the ordo dracul using this power they do this with it and so it's like a tree of power because i'm a big 
fan of, uh, of tech trees, of how trees are, tra trees of advancement like in Warhammer fantasy roleplay, where you have options. And this means you could theoretically have a group of characters who are all members of the same faction, the cryptocracy, but they all use, and they all, again, in theory, have the same power, except they all use it differently. And that's completely different to how we've done any of the other Chronicles of Darkness games. It's a bit experimental, but I, I think it's worked out well from the play, play testing of it that I've done. Awesome. Yeah, we look forward to seeing that. Definitely. So make sure you guys see that. Check all that stuff out. If you guys happen to have any questions uh, about any of these products, we'll have links to uh, Matthew's like social media, like Twitter or Facebook or whatever, and other important links in the podcast and the YouTube video description. Uh, Mr. Dawkins here is really personable, easy to talk to. And so he'll point you in the right direction, I'm sure, and give you the information that you need. So we're going to take our first break. When we come back, we're going to be talking about our subject, how to get into freelancing for White Wolf Onyx Path, uh, role-playing games, and just the gaming scene in general. So stay tuned. Hello, folks. Have you ever wished you could have an easy way to find gameplay videos and podcasts, or just media in general that deals with your favorite White Wolf role-playing games? Or have you ever wished you could find a forum to share gameplay that you have recorded, one which wouldn't be drowned out by random posts and discussion so that your media could get the attention you want? Well, we have the answer for you in a Facebook group we run called Weight Wolf RPGs Gameplay and Media. The group is specifically ran with the sole intent of it being a one-stop shop for people to view or share media involving the games we all love. We take thorough steps to ensure the page does not become cluttered and is easy to traverse. We are currently over 1,000 members strong, and we are continuing to rapidly grow with new media being shared every day. Stop on by. We hope to see you there. Welcome back. So... Before we get into the subject that we're going to be talking about today, I kind of wanted to give my reasoning behind of like why I felt this would be a good subject and just kind of like also kind of ties into like the mission statement of the Brian Diaries. So I feel like with anything in life, I'm talking about career, personal goals, whatever, anything that I, I find that I, I, I am involved in, I always try to find like a pace, man. I actually learned this quite uh, younger in my adult life about how it's always good to have someone to kind of try to like pace yourself off of whatever goal you, you have at that moment. Now, I don't mean like a mentor, you know, mentor is more someone who can kind of like guide you and give you advice and you can pick their mind. But sometimes uh, uh, what I consider to be a pace man or woman is someone that you might not interact with, but you can see what they're doing. You know, for example, with me being a content creator, I can kind of look at someone who's who's been in the scene for a long time, a content creator, uh, and, and kind of see, okay, how do they do that? How do they get where, you know, because they're kind of at where I want to be eventually. How can I get there? And I kind of look at their, what they do when it comes to, like, promoting their stuff or what they may do on social media. And I kind of, you know, if I like what they're doing, I may take some of it. If I don't like it, I may just disregard it. And, I, and I've done that with everything in life. I did that when I was in the military. I did that in my career. I did that when I was going to school. I do that in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, everything. If I have a goal, I want to look at someone and who is already there and see See what what I can take away from. So, one of the reasons why we introduced Matthew here and asked him to come on the show was because, you know, he went from being someone who was a fan who created these YouTube videos to where now he's writing in the industry that he, he that was a hobby of his. You know, he now is working for you know uh, uh white wolf with v5 he's working for onyx path as he said before he has the onyx path cast which i said without fucking up Woo i always mess that up and he is and he is where a lot of people want to be right now you know especially with the advent of stuff like the storytellers vault where you see people writing a lot of people you kind of see now want to get into writing for these games that we love so what better way to do that than have a pace man and i think that you know mr dawkins is a perfect pace man 
if you want to try to emulate someone to get there, you know? And so we, you know, he's been gracious enough to come on here. And uh, so we're going to pick his brain about how someone can get into the freelance writing and role-playing games in the world of darkness setting specifically. So thank you again. I appreciate it, Matthew. I really appreciate you coming on here. I know you're <laughs> obviously a busy fucking man and you don't drink coffee. What the fuck over, but cool. You do it. And it must be a healthy breakfast. So I'm sure you eat your Wheaties, but, um, <laughs> But but I guess the first question I'm going to have to kind of open this up is, uh, what what do you feel is the most important thing that uh, someone who wants to write for RPGs could do to build their skill set? You know, like what's the what's the one thing they can do like as a like an exercise of sorts? I guess. Oh wow, good question to open up. Uh, hmm. Well, I'd say two things, uh, and the first isn't going to be the obvious one. Uh, the first one is a sense of professionalism. And I know this may sound like a, a bit of a strange thing to say, but I will unpack that, as they say. So professionalism for me is incredibly important. Uh, and what that constitutes in the world of writing is the ability to hit deadlines, stay communicative with developers and fellow writers, uh, portray yourself well on social media, don't involve yourself in flame wars. Do we st still say flame wars these days? Doesn't matter. Uh, try, try not to get involved in too many hot button issues and basically do what you would do in any other workplace. These days, if you're a freelancer, social media is half of your workplace. It's where your audience see you, it's where your colleagues see you. So if you start acting unprofessional there, that can bleed through into your chances of getting hired again. I know that's the same in any private sector now because everyone is monitoring everyone else's social media. It's the same with even getting into the States now. Um, you know, you, you have run the risk of having your social media checked. So professionalism uh, it isn't just wearing a, a suit, a shirt and a tie uh, these days. It is the way the public perceive you. And if you don't have that down, and I extend that to your critical words about the company you want to work for, or indeed its peer companies, because we don't mind at Onyx Path, for instance, we don't mind people criticizing our work. Uh, it's not always going to be gold star, um, but there's a difference between being a critic, a reviewer, let's say someone who um, posts on social media a question about this thing, uh, why don't I understand this thing? Or could you explain this thing than someone who constantly lashes out? That isn't professional because you wouldn't get a job at McDonald's if you spent your time stood outside McDonald's decrying it and complaining about how they used to get funnel money to the IRA as a charity. Uh, which, as a point of interest, is why I've only ever eaten in McDonald's once, and that was on a um, road trip across Europe. It was a desperation situation. But that, that aside, you were, McDonald's wouldn't hire you if they knew that you were the uh, person protesting McDonald's outside. So why would Onyx Path hire you if you spent half your life uh, trying to destroy Onyx Path because you think you know better? The other thing is, and this is the more obvious answer, getting... So that's the networking answer, I guess. The actual content creation answer is the simple one, and it's read. And it sounds like it should be simple, but so few people do read now. Reading is supposedly down, or at least the reading of novels. And that's, again, because of the um, widespread nature and insidiousness, if you want to be macabre about it, of social media. It's a huge distraction. People spend more time on Facebook and checking emails and so on and playing games on the phone than they do with a book in their hand. And while they're still taking information in, there's no doubt about that, there's definitely benefits to these mediums. They are not getting a chance to read how writers write. And I've said in at least one other interview the, my favorite three authors are the th well, for me that's the three J's. It's Jane Austen, James Joyce, and J.G. Ballard. 
and they are three incredibly different writers uh, who handle three incredibly different subject matters and indeed for Jane Austen and James Joyce it's very easy for them to be favourite authors because they don't have a huge catalogue of work. Um, uh, well, I guess you could say James Joyce's novels are huge just by dint of one book being massive, but or a couple, but my point is they each write in wholly different ways. They write completely different genres and they address characters in incredibly different ways. Uh, James Joyce is a very strong environmental writer. He will tell you all about context on a page, but will give you very little detail about the people on it. Uh, you, you can get to the end of Ulysses and you know very little about the characters you've read about. And J.G. Ballard is a dystopian writer. He goes all the way from sci-fi through to very famous Empire of the Sun, which recounts his time as a, a child prisoner of war in, um, in Japanese-occupied China. Um, but he's also well known for dystopic novels like High Rise, Concrete Island, Crash. And J.G. Ballard is actually my favourite author, but he... Uh, it just has a an incredibly, well, it's known as Balladian way of writing, which is unlike anything else. And then you have Jane Austen, and Jane Austen's an interesting one because not many people do pick her, but if you consider the time at which she wrote, which is late 18th century, early 19th century, her novels are still just as accessible now as they were back then. And there's an awful lot of work from that turn of the 19th century, 18th, 19th century, uh, that are incredibly dense and or using language that just does not rest easy as you read it. Jane Austen has a universal style. Uh, the characters are believable, their motives are sound, and each chapter is a lovely condensed piece of fiction that anyone can access. Now, I say, for instance, read these three, but you can read anyone. You can read Harlan Ellison, you can read Will Self, or um, you know, even David Simon's Homicide, A Year on the Killing Streets, because all of these are incredibly fantastic authors. They're fantastic books, and you will learn a hell of a lot about the writing, you know, how to write, if you just read. Uh, so I know that's a long piece of advice, but it is incredibly vital that if you want to write, you need to read. Yeah, you bring I, I to kind of delve into to. Well, there's two points I'd like to delve into, but one I I totally agreed with you about the whole being a professional. You know, like uh, I remember growing up as a kid, my dad used to always tell me perception is reality for people. You know how you how you portray yourself is reality for a lot of people. You can't expect to people to to know what you were thinking at a time or you know what what your motives are uh if you're giving off a different perception and i um do agree with that in 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 a sense you know social media today can is a great at times and wonderful way to keep in touch with people and to gain information but it can also be the downfall of a lot of fucking people and a lot of smart people too i mean there was that story a few years ago about that neurosurgeon uh in florida she got drunk and um physically attacked a uber driver and someone recorded it and within three days she got fired from this very high paying mm -hmm. job where you have to be very educated obviously and her career just went to shit because of one bad mistake and there are times when i just see people in general, but especially people tied professionally, sometimes in the RPG industry, sometimes in other industries who just act a fool on social media. And I just tell myself like, not only a, you're making yourself look bad, but in my head, my natural instincts to assume that your, your company is the same way. I know that's not right. It's not way, a good way to paint, you know, with the same brush, everyone. But if I see someone who represents a company and they're, they're constantly acting unprofessional. I'm assuming in my head that the company is the same way, you know, and that could be a downfall. And companies don't want that. They don't want to be tied to someone like that because then their uh, reputation can be damaged. So that's a very good point. And um, you see that though a lot now. I think you're seeing more people act, uh, potential writers now uh, acting more professional, you know, acting um, adult like. I hate to say it, you know what I mean, but acting more like adults. So that's a very good point. Um, and to add a little bit too, like you're reading, I, I, one of my favorite, I have a lot of authors I enjoy and a guilty pleasure of mine is one of my favorite authors is Stephen King. I know he's not Jane Austen or anything like that, but he's written some books that, that I, I love and I grew up reading him. So it's kind of got like that special place in my heart. And one thing that always blows my mind is for how much that guy writes. And he's like, what in the seventies now he reads a lot. He's constantly, oh. 
Yeah. He's, well, well don't, don't be mistaken into thinking, you know, Jane Austen is considered a classic, uh, or her books are considered classics because of their age. Uh, in terms of quality, there are books that are far more have far more artistic value, I could, suppose you could say. The only reason Stephen King probably isn't regarded as widely as one, because he's more recent, although I know he's been doing it for about 40 years, if not longer, and also because his main genre is horror, and horror has never been taken seriously as a genre on a literary level, excepting, of course, a few standouts, uh, you know, Dracula, uh, <laughs> Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, and so on. Yeah, definitely. And he constantly reads to this day, you know, which which I've tried to emulate. I'm not someone who wants to be a writer, or I uh, I, I I write in crayon, so I'm not. I wouldn't be a good writer, but uh, I love to read. So yeah, it's, that, those are very two um, awesome pieces of information. So I appreciate that definitely. Oh, I'm glad. I hope it helps. I hope it helps someone who's listening. Just yeah, just remember that. Yeah, don't <laughs> try and rein yourself in when you want to say something stupid on social media. Speaking of social media, one of the things we did when we were preparing for this interview with you is uh, kind of uh, stretching out with uh, people online, trying to find uh, uh, things that they wanted to know from you personally and getting your personal touch on things. And something that people wanted to know is how do you juggle all these different projects like that you just mentioned in the first part of this podcast, all these different things you're working on and your social life and 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 all of that how do you how do you manage all of these things all at once how do you keep uh, well, yourself going yeah it can be difficult uh, undoubtedly uh, you know i could joke and just say i'm on a husk <laughs> but in in honesty it, it can be difficult and the only real way you can handle it is through organization I, the, all the contracts I mentioned, all, all the books, I, I consider them contracts, of course, because that's how I get paid. I get hired in terms of contracts. I'm a contracted employee, even with um, Onyx Path Publishing, for which I'm an in-house developer. I, over, I oversee all of the World of Darkness books. And yet, I'm still on a contract. And so that's why I use that language. Anyhow, uh, I mention all these books but each of them has different deadlines each of them has a different writing team sometimes there's a bit of crossover and so i have to timetable my day my week potentially my month and if you imagine lots of overlapping rows of when a book is due to end its first draft stage and go into red lines i need another book to be starting in first drafts uh, so that i'm never having to do 10 sets of red lines all at once red lines being the point at which i i would go through all the first drafts people have written and say uh, leave comments say this works and put lines through things and say please remove this it's completely out of keeping with tone and or what please explain to me what you mean by this as a teacher would go through your coursework redlining or or, a, or indeed an editor would if you were working for a newspaper so uh it's it really comes down to a lot of tight organization but in order to keep myself motivated the best things i can do are find times to actually go out gaming because i need to keep my interest in the fun side of this hobby replenished because it can become a grind writing 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 but i also need to write in places that aren't just my home i i love the fact that i have enough room to have a study uh which is it's basically a a third bedroom but i converted it so it's just a, a small library but the point is that's fantastic up to a point but it is quite possible to get cabin fever even no matter how many people you speak to online uh, if you're home alone a lot of the time it's very isolating so working being the i guess archetypal hipster writer working in a cafe or one of the uh, better places to work in is a pub or bar and uh, my colleague eddie webb actually made a, a very interesting post about this uh, i guess a couple of months ago now that the incentive for working in a bar eh, or pub is there's a lot more happy chatter around you um but a lot of people are off doing their own thing there's not the i guess you can get a bit intoxicated if you just keep drinking coffee it'll make you lose your focus 
Um, whereas if you're working in a pub, it's very unlikely you're going to be working and getting drunk. You'll be drinking soft drinks and tea and maybe coffee as well. But there's also the idea of reward. If you are, if you like a nice drink at the end of your day or with your lunch, you can have a cocktail, for instance, to say that was a good job well done. Point is to motivate yourself, you need to not only organize your time, but also your environment. Uh, everything needs to be as accessible and comfortable. What's that word? I guess ergonomic as you need it to be. Uh, otherwise, you will find yourself crushed by it all. That's, that's an interesting point because I found when I was going to school, uh, when I was going for my master's, sometimes like I just couldn't write when I was at home. You know, I'd have to write these, you know, rather large papers and everything. So sometimes there was a little coffee shop that I'd go to and I'd feel all young and hip, even though I was in my 30s. You know what I mean? <laughs> like I'm Joel Cool clacking away while listening to contemporary music. But, and there's no such thing as too much coffee. Just saying, just want to point that out. Disclaimer for all Starbucks if you're listening. But that's really interesting. So do you say that you put in like an honest date, like an honest eight hours a day working on it? Do you treat it like a nine to five job? Like these are the times I'm going to be writing and I uh, will be doing nothing else. And then do you have like, family time and stuff like that too well i try to usually i will work from eight till five um i've always enjoyed working so and no matter what field or profession i've been in and i've been in a few um so it's no great burden for me to wake up reasonably early and in fact as i have a very young son i don't have a choice in the matter i have to get up early and i don't say that as a joke or as a complaint um, if anything, it helps as a motivator. <clears throat> and I like to be finished by the time if he's in uh, nursery, but before he gets home, so I can actually spend the evening with him. And then depending on if my wife and I decide to stay up and watch anything or go somewhere or do something, um, I might work in the evening after people have gone to bed. I might not. But the only time I dedicate to writing is that eight till five. I will always go out in the morning or endeavor to go out unless I have a really tight deadline um, and I'll go out around 10 or 11 o'clock to the local gym uh, I'll usually go swimming because it's more important to me that I get good stretches in because I'm ob obviously sat down a lot um, but yeah if I'm not working from home that's a little more tricky but luckily I'll be walking around to wherever I'm working in that case I don't drive so I pretty much walk everywhere um but yeah it's uh I, I, you know that said that makes me sound like some kind of wonder man but on friday night i was writing till 3 30 in the morning um and again no coffee chris uh <laughs> Jesus Christ. i know it's like tell me your secret but we'll talk about that offline but holy cow that <laughs> it's that's, cocaine it's cocaine dude. that's, <laughs> that's you know, how rumors have started do, do either of the two of you smoke no, no, I don't smoke. I don't. Now, uh, I'm I'm not a smoker. Um, however, there are great advantages to smoking. This is going to be an odd public service announcement. Um, it's very odd, isn't it? The Obviously, it's illegal now to advertise cigarettes in the way that you used to be able to advertise them. You're not going to see someone glamorously smoking a cigarette anymore. But yeah. for all the... Well, everyone knows now that cigar cigarettes are a killer. Everyone knows that tobacco, that, um, that, that, you know, the tar will build up, you will likely get cancer, and it will probably kill you. But no one, therefore, extols the virtues of smoking. And the virtues of smoking, as with anything containing something like nic nicotine or a small euphoric, is they, will, they make you work more. They make you work faster. And this is obviously why a lot of writers will live off of coffee. But in the past, quite often it would be coffee and cigarettes. If you smoked while you worked, you would get that much more done than the person who didn't because that nicotine was keeping your energy levels up. It was giving you that boost. And it was also giving you the sense of satisfaction that you'd done the job well because it's a euphoric. So it's one of those odd little tidbits of the way, I guess, working culture has changed. I, I wonder, on this complete tangent, how much less is done now that so few people are smoking or whether they've just replaced that fix for something else like coffee or Red Bull. 
Yeah, I, it's an interesting point you bring up. I feel that, uh, and I'm not going to even compare what we do with actual plays or anything like that to the to the writing job you have, uh, because you know you vastly do a lot more. But I find when I'm in like better shape, because I'm I'm a physical type person too. I like to work out and do stuff like that. And I find when I've been active physically and I'm like you know eating healthy that my energy creative energy is a lot better than it is if i'm going through a period where i'm like taking a break from training and i'm just kind of like eating you know whatever's put in front of me tons of ice cream that's my weakness and uh, i just find like my 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 creativity drops down a lot so do you find that being healthy like swimming and walking and oh, everything yeah. like that helps yeah there's this misnomer that especially when you start doing exercise in other words let's say you haven't done an exercise for several months or even years because not everyone does and not everyone has to indeed to maintain a comfortable body image or or sense of health some some people just eat healthily and that's fine uh, but there's this misnomer that you will feel tired after doing exercise. Most people feel tired after doing exercise if they over-exercise. Um, you know, if they, usually because, yeah, they've, they have stressed their body. And that will usually come through not warming up. Um, so if you, and to be honest, that's partly why I like swimming. Because swimming requires very little warm-up. The the pool is a cushion, and it will give as much as you um, as, as you put into it. So, the, yeah, I, I agree. If you if you find time for a bit of exercise, even if it's just a walk, you should come back f feeling refreshed. Um, some people find that message. Some people find that message very demoralizing because it can be incredibly difficult to motivate yourself to do any form of exercise if you don't find it interesting do and even i'll admit swimming can be a tremendous bore at times because unlike if you're in the gym you can't have your headphones on you can't be watching something on your uh, smartphone or what have you but you know i just usually set limits for myself i'll say okay i'm going to do 20 lengths in 20 minutes or something like that and off i'll go and if i do that i'll think fine how do i feel now and I either want to do that or I'll get in the jacuzzi or I'll go into the sauna or something like that because it's, again, it's more about relaxing the body but waking your mind up. Definitely, definitely. So being a writer, is there like any difference a writer should be aware of uh, between writing like regular like articles and books and writing for rpgs is there anything that like a writer should be aware of like you know because you may have someone who's written like a lot of articles or blogs or stuff like that but never have written for an rpg is there anything that you'd recommend like you know you would make them aware of before they jumped into that uh i guess industry well i mean i've never written a novel i've written a short story for one of the vampire the masquerade anthologies and i guess i wrote lots of short stories when i was growing up and they, at college but um, my main takeaway is we've actually had a lot of freelancers at Onyx Path who have come from all kinds of fields. And most of them, if they can write in those other fields, they can write for RPGs. The main uh, difference is when it comes down to systems. Uh, Role-playing games are, of course, for the most part, quite system heavy. And this is something that we look out for when people make submissions to Onyx Path, which I'm sure one of you will ask me about at some point. But uh, the main main gist being that when you submit work to Onyx Path, as an example, we'll ask for a thousand words in a submission. Just a thousand. Don't go over that because we're not going to read more than that. And 500 words of that ideally should be setting, fiction, something flavorful that tells us how you write. And the next 500 words should be system. It doesn't even have to be the system of the game you're wanting to write for. It just shows that you can mechanically apply the idea of luck, chance, rolling dice, some random element, and converting that fiction that you've just written into some kind of mechanic that works in the game. The example I always use is disciplines in Vampire the Masquerade and Vampire the Requiem. If you look at the first dot of Dominate, around 500 words are dedicated to what that first dot does, how vampires use it, what clans use it, how clans use it differently, that sort of thing. The next 500 to 1,000 words are the, um, are the actual write-up of how the power works, mechanically speaking, or the next three dots, I should say, of powers. So that's 
a very good template to follow if you were to submit work to Onyx Path. It's think of how disciplines are laid out. You've got your fiction, and then you've got your first few dots of powers. If you can do that, you can demonstrate that you have you know how to write role-playing games. So one of the things about uh, writing in the modern world is that there's a lot of different uh, types of uh, tools out there for uh, capturing your ideas. Uh, different uh, programs, software, things out there that uh, can help you in your freelance career. What types of tools do you personally use? What kind of software has helped you along your way to um, maybe to track your timelines, you know, on your different projects or transcribing your audio into text or um, even even something for your own games, bullet points, events that you have? What, what kind of... Uh, software do you use to organize and and write well i'm uh, i'm dreadfully boring in that regard I, I guess for the most part i'm using the same microsoft package everyone else is going to but in terms of workflow what a couple of companies i've worked for have used a system a lot of people know about called jira uh, jira is a workflow management system that allows you to track topics set deadlines it will come up with red flags if you pass them you move your various assignments into different streams that show you how you know um, where along the process it is it allows you to track things that are um, it's to use a very corporate term sla uh, service level agreement that allows you to check whether your work is in sla or has dropped out of sla um, another very good piece of software is called write or die and it's a piece of background software you use that will kill you if you don't meet your deadline pretty much it shouts at you or well it will alert you if you've spent too long not writing so if you've spent too long on social media or watching youtube or what have you now that's that's a lovely motivator when you first start writing because i would say that the the point where prevarication is a problem is when you first want to get your foot in the door. When you have been writing for a little while, your prevarication is generally very good for fueling your ideas. And th this might sound quite dismissive, but when you first start writing, you have hundreds of ideas in your head. By the time you've got through your fourth or fifth project, you have rinsed those ideas. As it turns out, 100 of those ideas, when condensed into something workable, probably amount to about 10. And you've got, you put those 10 ideas on paper now. You've felt fantastic. I've got everything from my home campaign into books now. Now what? Well, now you've got to start looking for inspiration. And that's where you start prevaricating. Well, you start thinking it's prevarication. But when you're looking on Facebook or when you're reading the news, sites or when you're reading a novel god you know that would that would be fantastic wouldn't it or watching a tv series going on netflix or just binging on a couple of movies during the day you'll feel bad for doing it at first but when you then get back to writing you'll have so many other ideas and providing you're not just stealing those ideas wholesale and i don't many no don't know many writers who do you're you're taking inspiration from the world around you. It's the exact same thing that comedians do when they're looking for material or any other writer. So I guess in that sense, I mentioned write or die, but one of the key pieces of software that you can use when you've been writing for a little while is interacting with the world around you. And don't just limit that to using Facebook because you will only get the voices of people you hear all the time. Um, go to the library, get a book out that you've never read before by an author you've never heard of, and see what inspires you from that. Yeah, definitely, especially the inspiration thing. I do that reading. I tried to read like a new horror genre book by a new author just to get inspiration for our own stuff. So that's a very good point. So here comes the golden question. The golden question, which you kind of predicted would be asked, was <laughs> if someone wanted to write for Onyx Path Publishing, how could they? Uh, how could they get this done? Now I know you've discussed it on the Onyx Pathcast. Second time I pronounced it right. Woohoo! Yeah, and you, yeah, yeah, I know, right? And you, you've mentioned it before. But just for those of you, those who may not have heard it, whatever, all these people who want to become writers for Onyx Path, how can they do that? Okay, well, if you're not listening to the Onyx Pathcast, why not? 
But that aside, that aside. So Onyx Path, just to provide you with a bit of background, if you're unfamiliar with our company, uh, when I say our company, I am only a contractor, but I, I hold it very close to my heart. The uh, Onyx Path, we deal with publishing games we've licensed from companies like White Wolf and Eschaton Media. So we're publishing the World of Darkness games, Chronicles of Darkness games, and Dystopia Rising. Uh, we also and exalted, of course, and we also have our own products like Scion, Trinity. They came from Leaf C. Uh, there's Pugmire as well, which we licensed from Eddie Webb, and so on. How you get to write for Onyx Path Publishing? Well, we have a lovely submissions guidelines page on the website, and if I was feeling lazy, I would say to you, look it up and go from there. But something I think that's worth emphasising is that you absolutely must follow the guidelines on that submissions page. If you do not submit your non-disclosure agreement with your submission, we will not read it and we will not reply to you. If you do submit the NDA but you go over a thousand words, there's every possibility you won't even read the first thousand because what's the point if the good stuff is in the second thousand? We have a lot of submissions. Part of the idea of putting these guidelines in is to see whether you can follow instructions. A lot, an awful lot of companies will do this. They will want to know whether you can actually follow guidelines because most books have an outline, most books have a developer, and they will tell you, they will ask you to do certain things. If you can't do that at submission stage, you're not going to be able to do it on a book in progress, so you're not going to get hired. Now, dialing back a little, how you actually get your foot, I guess, on the ladder, let alone in the door. And one of the best ways is by writing, writing something. And I don't mean writing something for Onyx Path to publish. I mean something for you to publish. And you might think self-publishing, that's difficult. But we have these fantastic tools to you to name them. We have the Slarisian Vault. We have Canis Minor, and we have the Storyteller's Vault. The Slorician Vault is a Dungeons and Dragons self-publishing uh, tool that you can use to publish D&D material for the Scarred Lands setting. Uh, Scarred Lands is a Dungeons and Dragons campaign setting. It's been updated to 5th edition. You can buy it from drivethroughrpg.com. Now, the Slurisian Vault has art packets, it has templates, it has all kinds of things you can use to create your own Scarred Lands product. You don't need to know fantastic amounts about the Scarred Lands to actually do this. You could theoretically create anything and put it in there. But the point is, you write your material, you stick the art in, you put it up on DriveThruRPG with our blessing. We don't vet it, so I hope it's good and then you can put your own price on it you you get, gain profit for selling your own product but the important thing that's cogent and um i guess pertinent to the question is if you do this and if you do this a few times we can see your writing we can see that you can write that you're confident enough to put yourself out there and you're confident enough to fail because plenty of times we have failed. Now, Canis Minor is the exact same thing, but it's for the world, the realms of Pugmire and Monarchies of Mal, which are two fantasy settings, uh, fantasy post-apocalyptic settings that we publish on its path. And the Storytellers Vault, of course, the big one is the same, but for World of Darkness, specifically at this time, time of recording, Vampire the Masquerade, Dark Ages, Victorian Age, and Werewolf. Dark Ages and Wild West and Wealth the Apocalypse. You can create your own vampire and werewolf products, put them up on Storyteller's Vault and sell them. Again, the, in the past, if you wanted to hire a brand new writer who didn't have anything to their name, that was a gamble. If you wanted to hire someone who was written for another company, you we would often go to that company, someone we know at that company, because it's a very incestuous industry. We know each other very well. So we'd say, hey, this writer, they've just asked to write for us. What can you tell us? At that point, you're relying on someone else to sing your praises. If you go the Slurisian Vault, the Canis Minor, or the Storyteller's Vault route, you are creating your own reference. 
you're showing that you can create products of a decent quality and they don't need to be of a quality you'd want to see on a bookshelf because these are all downloadable uh, a lot of people are put off from these products by the idea they might think this has to be of the same quality as something like onyx path or white wolf or wizards of the coast no that's absolutely not the case and we're not going to judge you based on production values we are the publisher of our products you would be the writer or indeed the editor or the artist or whatever it is you're submitting to be and something i would throw in is and this is uh, something that's very easy to say and not always easy to swallow is don't be afraid of rejection and by rejection i mean don't be afraid of hearing nothing like most industries these days we um we have a lot of people that want to work for us uh, there's an awful lot of people out of work who want to work in the world uh, in the western world especially and they would love every single time they apply for a role to hear back for why they didn't get it the fact is we get so many submissions that we would need to hire someone specifically for the rejection and that sounds harsh and in fact that may put you off from submitting but i promise you most of those rejections are because they simply didn't follow the guidelines uh, it is that easy you know if you don't send the nda in, that's you out of the pile but if you do submit and i'll use an example here of one of two of my writers for wealth the forsaken uh, i hired two guys by the name of michael jacobson and wyatt greer and they hadn't written anything before they're both wealth the forsaken fans and sorry and joyce chung as well and they all three of them had submitted samples for wealth the forsaken over the last two years we hadn't hired them over the last two years joyce had been hired on a separate book but i wanted them specifically because of their wealth the forsaken samples because we keep all of them we keep them all in a central drive we can access all of them so when we're re when we are developing a book for a game line and we want some new writers on it we'll go into that file into that folder we'll look for some samples and we'll think does this person have the right voice for the book i'm doing yes okay let's drop him an email if he's still interested in writing for us if yes brilliant would you like this word count we only need 3,000 words or we need 10,000 words or maybe even 20,000 words written in two months time and if they say yes brilliant you're brought aboard you may not hear back immediately you may not hear back at all but don't take not hearing back as you having failed I would strongly suggest that if you haven't heard anything in six months send another sample but send it for a different game because it shows that you can write across a multitude of genres or settings that we handle the more samples you send in the more impressive you look just don't do it all in the course of one week otherwise we might think you're a bit of a pest yeah you bring up a good point first having perseverance you just got to persevere and keep you know what i mean trying and, and and not give up and a good friend of the podcast who was actually a guest on the podcast earlier josh heath is a perfect example of that he now has contracted you guys to write for a couple things and he's a guy who put stuff on the st vault on the storytellers vault all the time he's a guy who kept trying and persevering one step after another and got there and it can happen and jacob who's working on wraith right now uh i'm gonna butcher his last name but uh he you see these you see folks in the community constantly on social media who are getting scooped up and it's really awesome to see that you know uh, and that there's this perception that just they are just fans you know we hired them because they're fans and again couldn't be further from the truth someone like josh has put the work in he has released a ton of storytellers vault books and he has always accorded himself fantastically well in a professional manner on social media He's always been very supportive, but he is, hasn't been afraid to criticize when we've made a mistake. And in short, so I hired him. I was uh, over developing, I guess, Gods and Monsters for Mage the Ascension. And we needed an emergency fill-in writer. The book was effectively at development, and we noticed a gap. And I thought, I know Josh knows Mage the Ascension. And, have, and I based that on all the work that he's done on Storyteller's Vault. So I went to him. And I said, would you be up for doing some emergency writing? He said, yes. And we went from there. And I've done that on uh, on some other books as well with, with some other emergency writers. Alan Gowing is a guy who I hired for Pan's Guide for New Pioneers and then subsequently hired for Contagion Chronicle and Dark Eras 2. 
but simply because he has that good reputation. He's um, specifically, he's in the creative writing field, not RPGs, but I hired him because I knew that he could do the job based on reputation. So would you, would you say that a summary would be that someone who puts themselves out there and is submitting their work and isn't afraid to be criticized and have any sort of uh, rejection, somebody who is constantly trying to improve and is actively working to produce content is someone that you're going to be looking for. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, that sounds like Superman, um, <laughs> but definitely there's, you know, I guess Josh is Superman then, huh? Yeah, I, I think so. You know, a little bald or a little more bearded, but they're pretty close. Probably more of a super villain, um, <laughs> more of a... He's my Yoda. <laughs> Josh is a friend of ours. We, yeah. we, we maintain a lot of contact with. Yeah, he's my Yoda, man. He constantly hears me and gives me advice and everything like that all the time. So no, love you, Josh. Really <laughs> Definitely. Uh, before we go to our break for our final session, session, excuse me, our final section, I had a good idea for a piece of software in the middle of all this talk that we had. Uh, I think we should call it podcast or die. And then you can like put your podcast, like the Onyx path podcast. And if people don't listen to it, it shocks their keyboard or we can even do something like that, you know, and, and then get them to where they could check out the Onyx path cast. What do you think Sounds about that? Sounds like a lawsuit waiting to happen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah and that, that's the kind of thing we like. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's dark. Right? It's good publicity. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, on that note, uh, we're going to take our next break. Stay tuned, and where I uh, shamelessly self-promote our stuff and tell you what's coming up on our channel. So see you then. High Level Games, the industry's first choice in taking your games to the next level. We are a podcast blog and new media network at highlevelgames.ca. We have blog posts about all of your favorite games going up five days a week and a podcasting network with actual plays and shows that discuss role-playing games with more rolling out all the time. We are on iTunes, Twitch, and YouTube. Find out more information at highlevelgames.ca, a site that certainly isn't controlled by a shadowy board of directors of otherworldly origin. That's highlevelgames.ca. Please, help. They're coming. <laughs> All right, welcome back, everyone. So let's talk about a few things before we let you guys go. Uh, first is the White Wolf... Uh, uh, RPG media and gameplay Facebook group that we run. It's me, Andrew, uh, the homeboy Josh Heath, who you heard us uh, sing praises to earlier, uh, Slavic and Tillman from our channel. It's a Facebook group that we run where content creators go and share content from like the world of darkness. Like we're talking about podcasts, a a actual plays, uh, blogs, art, uh, reviews, ST Vault products, you know, and even live new streams, whatever you got. Yeah, whatever you got. Yeah, definitely. Uh, we have clear set rules for people to read through. If you have questions we're easy to get with, you can reach out to us. And there's this new awesome feature Facebook groups have where you can tag posts. And so if you want to look for like actual plays, you can click on actual plays and it'll show you all the actual plays. If you want to look for like Werewolf the Apocalypse actual plays, so on and so forth. So you can search and find stuff there. Now, I tried to go back because our group's not two years old. It's like a year and a half. I tried to go back. Uh, and tag everything but there gets to a point in facebook where you start scrolling down to older stuff and it just like it, it's it's just doesn't work that well so i got about a year back a little over a year i just couldn't get to some of the older stuff so i apologize yeah, unfortunately chris only has so much time to dedicate his life to wife and there's only so much cold brew you can drink before you pass out and your wife gets angry and you're just like not responsive because you <laughs> crashed horribly. No, I'm joking. Uh, I'm not joking. No, you're not. For real. I'm for real. Uh, another thing too is we have a Discord now. For those of you who don't know, there's a link in our podcast descriptions and our video descriptions. Uh, we have about like 120 people on there now. Man, is it bumping. It is extremely busy it's fun there's always conversation going uh you know we have like a general chat room where we talk about anything world of darkness stuff whatever then we have individual rooms for our actual plays all the people who play uh or run games for our channel are in on there and i wanted to give a shout out to our two new admins that we have on there wayward ginger and epic botch these wonderful ladies are, are helping us run this group it's really awesome shout out to you too 
uh, it was kind of awesome to hear that Wayward Ginger and Mitch met in in real life at a Ren Fest, which is totally awesome. Yeah, I think they just they just decided that you know, hey, you know, we live near each other, and we're we're both looking for something to do and hang out. And she goes to these Ren festivals, and he wanted to take his kid, and they just got together and met up yeah. in person and had a good time. Wayward Ginger has like the best stories about like because she travels and she has like leather goods and all that stuff like that, and she creates stuff for these Ren Ren fests. And these stories that she tells it just from what's that movie about like the um uh uh it sounds like a carnival like uh, like stories all these different crazy stories that she tells yeah. and it's just awesome and I look forward to and she's actually running her, uh, an online game right now too which is cool with some people so that's awesome oh, yeah that's another thing to mention on that uh, Discord channel we do have a looking for game uh channel that you can go on and. If you are a person who is looking to get involved in uh, playing games online, if you're look, just looking for a group to have fun, you know anything like that, you can come in and uh, just make a post. Or if you're looking to run something, uh, talk to us. We'll help you uh, promote it. And uh, just, you know, we, we want other people, even listeners, whoever, to just be able to enjoy this game as much as we do. Yeah, man, it's all about spread, spreading the positivity and all that stuff. That's why we run that media page. That's why we have this stuff. We just want people to enjoy these games because people like Matthew here and others have put like a, a love and effort. It's a it's a it's a labor of love for a lot of people, and we just want people to enjoy it because they're awesome, awesome settings. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, there I was on Mage the podcast. We, uh, I think it was two weeks ago, so you guys can go check that out. I was I was brought on to talk about like plot hook ideas for Mage the Ascension that I uh, have. Uh, I'm, I'm a, a new convert to uh, Mage the, the Ascension. I read Mage Twentieth recently. Absolutely fucking love that book. Uh, once our vampire, I don't know if this is official like announcement, but it's an announcement of sorts, I guess. But once like we tie up our vampire, the masquerade chronicle, I'll be running a mage, the ascension chronicle. Now that it might be like three or four years from now, but I'm already like starting to formulate ideas. I've been talking to the, the gang about that and everything. And so it was awesome being on there talking about some of the ideas I had, talking about some of our actual plays, and answering questions about that. So go by and check that out. That's Mage the podcast. You can find them on the media page on. Yes. I have Twitter. I have a, I have a, something to admit to you. I haven't What's listened that? to the episode yet. I'm sorry. I, ha- oh. I don't even know what you talk about. I haven't I haven't checked it out yet. But I'm gonna have to get, put that on my list. I did listen to some of his other episodes. Uh, his interview with uh, Karen, who uh, did the uh, uh, the the Mage uh, the Ascension uh, game that's on uh, Steam and on uh, Google Play, and I'm not sure if it's on. It should be on on i iPhone devices, right? Yeah, I um, think so. Yeah, she 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 was the uh, author of that. She he did an interview with her. I listened to that and some of his interviews with uh, Phil uh, Phil. Ricardo. Ricardo. Yep. Um, so you know, good content. So you guys check it out. I was honored to be on there. I, I was really surprised that he asked me to be on there, and I was surprised that he watched. He's like watched all of our stuff so i was like oh wow i was expecting kind of like i was really worried about going on there and like having to ask all these like deep mage questions and and me like you know like stuttering through it but it went really well and i really had a blast so uh yeah check that out and that's why we need that uh podcast or die app you need to be electrocuted right now, Andrew. You're dead to me. Uh now you're back alive (laughs) to me. So let's talk about what we have coming up. Next Sunday on the 15th we're gonna be doing our sixth sixth session of vampire the masquerade twin seas by night dread oh i'm fucking loving this man i this um i don't talk myself up i don't like talking myself up i'm just saying that this is the most comfortable i felt as a storyteller in any fucking story that i've ran i just feel like everything's fucking clicking i feel like we're tapping into like the eerie horror um personal horror aspect of vampire the masquerade right now the story is is just really like starting the layers are starting to get built on this cake and one thing that i am loving about it is not only the fucking characters in there but we are telling the story without having to like force all these characters to be together so like the story is being told but it's from these different perspectives of these characters you know occasionally they may come and speak to each other but then they separate and i was really fucking nervous about doing that but i haven't had a st hangover in the last three sessions and i just feel like man i i i I don't know uh, well, I know how Andrew feels because we've talked offline, but I just, I don't know if viewers are feeling the same way, but I just feel like of the, you know, the three Twin Cities by Night 
uh, story arcs we've done that this one just seems to be like gelling and is perhaps my favorite right now. So I'm really enjoying it. It's a good time. I've been enjoying it myself. I've been enjoying uh, playing the character that I have. I've uh, it's my first time playing a Nosferatu character, and it's been really enjoyable. Just like exploring the the you know the the horror side of being this monstrous creature on the outside, and just how he is that di- dichotomy with how he feels inside. You know, it's it's really fun. And on top of that, I think that um, overall, you're doing an excellent job with this story. Just uh, the, the, the title itself uh, is absolutely perfect. Twin Cities by Night Dread, you know. Hey, and Matt, just by the way, if you if you ever want to make like a, another by night product, uh, we wouldn't be, um, you know, rejecting anything about the twin cities or yeah we, we would love to see something about that that'd be great well of course it would be for v5 now um, yeah. i mean we we would we would definitely give it a try and put it on our channel just saying just throwing yeah. that out there <laughs> about that in my, um about well no in all seriousness uh my i white wolf to my knowledge aren't going to be publishing a great many books after the first three that will be down to licensees uh is it licensees or licensors uh, either way it'll be down to whoever <laughs> whoever takes the license to do it and it's not just going to be one company so if you want to make your own book and have Chris, it, we need to get on the that official stamp of approval on it and just speak to uh, someone at white wolf and you never know it might your dreams <laughs> might come true here's what i'll do i'll buy one of those big box of crayons that have like the hundred different colors on there with a little sharpener yeah, I'll yeah get to fucking work all right i'll start Look, as long as as long as you follow the guidelines remember you got to yeah. follow the guidelines and and we submit it and look we could have tcbn in fuck a yeah book that sounds well, awesome to me well it's <laughs> in the guidelines about writing your draft in crayon so <laughs> you're right all right, sweet. I'll get to work and I'll I'll sign that NDA in crayon too. I'll do it though, like in a bright color, so you can see that I signed the NDA. So I don't, you know what I mean, get bypassed. So we'll we'll make sure to get on top of that shit. He, he's uh, joking, but I'm not. <laughs> he's like, what? Yeah, Andrew. Uh, yeah, man, definitely. That that would rock. But uh, fucking a, man. There's so much shit going on that. Yeah, that I don't even know if I could formulate that. But I'm having fun running it. This last session, like like you said, that dread. Uh, I I I gave the name to it based off a of Clive Barker short story in the Books of Blood, and I really feel like I, I was hoping to tap into that feeling of dread. I feel like I have, and as a storyteller, not to spoil, but the, uh, that last session just like really like me ha- like afterwards, I had to like it's one of those sessions, you know, and we don't do like uh, gratuitous violence just for the sake of violence, and we're we are a horror actual play. We do tap into the horror, but we're not edge lord or any shit like that. But it was just really like intense like moving scene where i had to like afterwards i felt like i don't know i just felt off you know i felt like uh it was good though it was a good feeling but it was an uncomfortable feeling but i felt like we we, we did good in there so i'm really happy about that and then on i the think t- that pretty much sums up all of tcbn yeah yeah definitely definitely man uh it's it's um it's it's intense i don't even know how i can articulate it but maybe one day i can but it's definitely uh it, it's fun and it's fun being able to tell a horror story with my friends and then on the 22nd we're gonna have changeling the lost vanity coming back we had to skip this last month because adam had real life you know important stuff like vacations and spending time with your oh no brother. god you know but uh man i fucking adam, love i know you're listening i know yeah, you're yeah. Listening. we all, <laughs> we all love you we're adam's leaving, a, yeah adam's leaving a, us hanging yeah adam's the nicest dude ever <laughs> like ever involved in rpgs and he's the guy who will apologize about being too nice which he's just such a nice dude but man changing the lost vanity is fucking awesome you know like uh matthew explained his whole his story in seattle and like it is a game where you really get to explore like the scars and, and emotional scars ptsd that come from being a kidnapping victim and there that that this game really has grown into that and it has grown i mean we had like what two or three sessions at my house like where it was just like this emotional dealing with with turmoil constant. turmoil just, and personalities that are different yeah exactly man the it's, way adam was bring, able to bring out just those themes with some of the uh, npcs and the conversations they have and the, oh my god it's just so it's so horrible but at the same time as a game it's fun you know it's it's a it's a really fun experience but at the same time it's like it's a really 
it's really terrible situ situation when you think about it and that just makes the game more intriguing to me it's so good and i want i i can't wait for the 2e game to be released and just to just delve more into this it's so good yeah they took my money too i threw my money at my computer screen when that shit came out i was like take it take it and um <laughs> but uh one thing that uh, before we move on to the, what game will be after that one thing that i a couple things about change and lost vanity is one, this is Adam's first time storytelling. I mean, like it's insane that we've had two story arcs with people's first time storytelling. And um, you, I wouldn't tell, I wouldn't know if I was listening to it and I didn't know the story behind Adam. I'd be like, oh wow, I can't believe this is first time storytelling. And two, I don't give a shit what any. I mean, like I legitimately think it is fucking genius and it blows away anything I did storytelling. How he took the ogre frank who is this slavic was just like i'm just gonna make him kind of have him be in the background and has used his character as a witness to major meta plot that is being exposed while the rest three of us are being emo johnnies you know what i mean whining to each other but like yeah. he's taking this simple really character clever. yeah really clever he's taking this simple character who doesn't know what's going on around him that he's witnessing and and us as players, and I'm sure the viewers are feeling the same way, are seeing this larger story, but this one character who's witnessing it does not understand what he's seeing. Yeah, and like you said, it's like um, um, the the character from The Sopranos who's just really dark and just is just horrible. And as as individuals, we're sitting by witnessing this, you know, like just like whoa, man, yeah. I can't believe he's doing that. But you know, as uh as far as the characters go, we, we have no idea, you know? Yeah. None, none whatsoever. And I think it's brilliant. It's, 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 it's the, this, I really think that it's better than anything I've ever done as a storyteller and um, kudos to Adam. If you're listening to this, man, I, I fucking love it and I can't wait to play it again and I've missed it. So, and then next we have on the 29th, we have hunters, hunters Two corruption, which is a game that we just started. We've done a character creation session and a first session, which Andrew runs, uh, man, Dude, when you have David Larkins, shout out to David Larkins from the Esoteric Order of Role Players, check their shit out. It's fucking primo shit uh, when it comes to actual plays. When he comes on and says that that scene with Dr. Gregory and his estranged wife where she basically tells him the marriage is done at that dinner was some real shit. That was some real fucking shit, man. Like, <laughs> like I fucking was like sitting here while we're playing, muted, like feeling like I was... I mean, I, I felt empathy for like i was like and i had to remind myself we're playing make-believe this isn't real life and i'm literally watching this conversation between you and tillman who plays them by the who plays dr gregory and i was like holy fucking shit balls man this is some people listen awesome. to the podcast versions but if you're watching the actual like videos you can see chris just like spazzing out in the background just having this like meltdown from like the conversation like he's watching this like television drama and so that alone was like oh well thank you for the compliment good sir it was just it was really nice to be able to have that kind of an impact and um i am glad to be able to run something on the channel and i look forward to uh pulling the heartstrings some more in the future yeah definitely any uh any teasers you want to tell us what we have to look forward to or <laughs> uh, yeah sure i'll give you a teaser i'll give you a teaser um smithsonian museum marcus vittel and uh gunfire whoa so pray tell is this because of your recent obsession with uh becca jihad diary it, that it, it might it might have something to do with it i'm not gonna go into too much detail but uh i did pull some inspiration from that book so it's it's uh, auspicious that we have matthew dawkins on today because I uh, I was reading through that a lot, and that chapter on Washington, D.C., along with some of the information in Washington, D.C. by night, inspired a lot of the pl plot that I have for this game. So, yeah, I'm those... very glad to hear that. I mean, it's always lovely to hear that something you've written has actually inspired a game. Oh, I, I can go on for hours on, like, the plot threads that are riddled throughout that book. So... Side story, uh, Andrew's a lightweight when it comes to cold brew. So Andrew, actually, I got him to try cold brew once, and he ended up standing on the street corner in his neighborhood, waving the Becca Jihad diary around, standing on a milk crate box and preaching about it. Man. And he literally, this guy, and, and I'm being sarcastic, but this guy literally has not shut up about that book and fucking since it came out. He it, loves it. And it's a great book. And for those of you uh, who, who, I mean, I think everyone knows now, I don't think I need to inform anyone, but uh, Mr. Dawkins here was really a, a critical part of that book. 
check it out. Like, the, uh, I mean, it is fucking awesome, man. It's a great book. Everyone who's read it has loved it. I've not heard one complaint about it. And if you uh, like, I do. I do have one complaint. <laughs> well, I do. I do have one complaint. Do I, do I want to hear this? I'm sure you do. Yeah, on PDF format, it's really hard to read. Yeah, it's I just can see it's that. it's difficult to navigate. Other than that, it's amazing. That's why everyone needs to buy the print version. I know, I know. I'm just broke. <laughs> what, you're telling me the baller lifestyle of creating actual plays hasn't, like, you didn't get your limo yet or your crystal or anything like that? Man, it's awesome. I was telling uh, Matthew how I haven't even taken, I'm looking at my bookshelf now, my special edition one out of its plastic yet. It's just sitting there looking beautiful right now in my collection. Uh, I would... I digress, though. And then finally, on our next episode of The Brian Diaries, we are going to have Nathan from 25 Years of Vampire the Masquerade, and he's going to be telling us about how to run a World of Darkness game on Discord, if you don't know, one of their Patreon, um, what do you call them, Patreon rewards, I guess, or Patreon... Like a benefit, I guess. benefit of uh, backing them on Patreon is you can play in this Discord game that they run for Vampire the Masquerade that takes place in the LA by night setting. And so, um, I mean, man, if you go on their Discord, you will see, like, they put a lot of work in there. So I thought, hey, there's a lot of people who want to run games. Maybe people would like to run a game on Discord. So he has been awesome enough to want to come on here and will kind of tell us how to do it and because i have no clue how to do any of this stuff and like we said with the brian diaries we want to like educate people on certain aspects so we felt that would be an awesome one and then finally before i let you all go back to our regular lives uh i've almost done with our my 2018 goal for our channel of re-editing our older podcast because what i had done is i simply just ripped our our audio from our video and just posted it as a podcast and then i started listening to it and i was like oh man this is not good like like i fucking cringe that some of the technical issues sound issues side talk whatever so in january 1st i started going through and editing all of them that uh, uh before i kind of really knew what audacity was capable of now i do but you know whatever so i'm almost done i only have nine more episodes of our vampire the masquerade wars on fire sabbat game that we ran and i'll be done and that was a hefty goal. That was editing and listening to over a hundred podcasts that I had to do for that. So there's a light at and the end of the. Each one of those is like at least thirty minutes long. Yeah, yeah, it's insane. Yeah, at least thirty minutes long, you know. But it's worth it. We did new intros. We added like you know, I, you just learn these little Audacity is like this crazy tool that has like all these different options. And so I watched all these like YouTube tutorials and kind of like, oh, this is how you do that. This is how you do that. And so now I kind of um you know learn You've how to definitely do grown as an editor uh as far as video quant content goes and yeah. uh, i i am particularly proud of the content that you have put out out there so thank you thank you chris and uh if anyone else is appreciative of his work please please leave him a comment he will cry himself to sleep yeah yeah or itunes review itunes review helped out a lot i still haven't figured out the morgan freeman voice filter to add to my voice yet but i'll figure that out i'm gonna get that and then i'll go and redo and edit all of them so but on that chris note we spend chris spent four hours of his life that <laughs> night editing <laughs> with Matthew Dawson. that's that's actually pretty good <laughs> we need to talk on the side all right we'll make a new audacity filter or the gentleman gamer audacity filter i've changed my voice to yours man for our, our games man it would probably up our viewership a lot. So without for, uh, without further ado, I think it's time for us to go. Do you have anything to say, Mr. Dawkins, before we let you go back to your normal life? What don't I have to say? No, uh, <laughs> the only thing I, I have left to say is if you love your horror role-playing games, if you love role-playing games in general, please do check out the Geist, the Sin Eaters Kickstarter while it is ongoing. And if you do check it out after it's ongoing, that's fine, because there'll be a link to back a kit where you can back it anyway. We aren't picky. We'll take your money. But Geist is is a wonderful game and deserves the love that it's getting right now for a premium edition. It's a real second chance for that game, which is all about second chances, given that you come back to life after having recently died in it. So please check out Geist. And thank you very much for having me, both of you. Uh, thank you for great, uh, gracing us with your presence. Yeah, of man. course. Seriously. Thank you for being here. We yeah. uh, we are very appreciative of that. Awesome. So, all right, everyone. See you guys later. Leave me alone. Quit snooping on me. I want to talk to my friends. Bye. The Los Angeles metropolitan area 
is constantly growing and changing. The central district is full of new buildings. The Hollywood and Wilshire districts, once far from downtown, now are part of a which spreads past Beverly Hills and out to the ocean. But why is all this going on in Los Angeles? Why is Los Angeles an exploding city? Neon Masquerade The Demon's Mirror Thirteen Candles Three Chronicles Running Through the Undead Veins of the City of Angels The Esoteric Order of Role Players Actual Play Podcast invites you to drink deeply. Go to eorpodcast.com and search the Duets tag to find out more. <laughs>